Hi, I'm Dave Hillowitz. So this is a video about how to create a decent sampler instrument. Decent Sampler is a free sampling engine available for Mac, for Windows, uh, for iOS. Uh, and a bunch of people have reached out to me uh, asking me how they can make their own presets, their own sample libraries for this platform. Ultimately, I definitely expect to make a bunch of visual tools for creating sample libraries, but right, right now, the only way to make presets for it is using a text editor. I've actually been working on documenting the file format, uh, and by the time this video goes up, the documentation should be basically complete. Okay, let's get started. At its core, each uh, sample library consists of two things, uh, a directory that contains a bunch of assets like WAV files and images, and a text file uh, that basically describes how to use those assets. The text file in this case is called a DS preset file. Uh, so yeah, let's get to work on it. Uh, I'm using Sublime Text because I, yeah, I love it. It's a great text editor, but you can really use anything that's got good syntax highlighting for XML files. Uh, in fact, I'm going to turn on syntax highlighting right now. I'm going to do this from scratch so that, um, yeah, I can explain everything. Um, there is a boilerplate at the end of the reference guide, and most of the time I'm guessing that's what people are going to use. Just copy and paste it and, yeah, change what doesn't match your instrument. Okay, let's get back to the text editor. Uh, so the first thing in each file is an XML declaration, and that's what tells the Decent Sampler uh, engine that the file it's looking at is, in fact, XML. That goes at the top of all the files. Uh, the other thing that's going to be in every single decent sampler file is uh, a decent sampler tag. Uh, and that's a top level tag, and there should be only one per file. OK, now that we got that, uh, we can actually start our sample mapping process. Uh, my plan for this video is I'm going to do sample mapping first, then effects, and then we're going to build a UI. Samples are arranged in groups. Uh, this is done for convenience, uh, really, in order to keep things a little bit logical. It's kind of like SFZ. So first thing we need is a groups tag. Uh, and there should be only one of those in each decent sampler file. This is not to be confused with the group tag. Within the groups tag, you can have as many uh, group tags as you want. That's a little bit confusing. And then within those, you can have your samples. Uh, and obviously, you can have as many samples as you want. Samples are where you do the actual mapping, where you actually define the zones that make up your virtual instrument. So let's look at the files we actually have. Uh, we have got four round robins, uh, no velocity layers, not too many samples, like 32 samples, uh, divided into four groups, four round robins. OK, so first things first, let's grab the file names and bring them into our text editor. Uh, on the Mac, that's pretty easy. Uh, you just select your files, hit Control-C, and yeah, you can paste them into any text editor like that. OK, uh, because I'm using Sublime Text, I can do a lot of kind of like fancy text editing. I can edit all the lines at the same time. Uh, and that's pretty useful for something like this, where really what I want to do is turn each one of these into a valid sample tag. There are two required parameters for sample tags. One of them is path. It's the relative path of the uh, actual sample to be loaded. The other one is root note. Root note is the actual note value of the key. Uh, so for example, this one would be A sharp 4. This one would be B3, whatever. Decent Sampler accepts either uh, MIDI note numbers or MIDI note names. Uh, I highly recommend using note numbers because uh, MIDI names are not standardized across samplers, whereas uh, note numbers are the same regardless of what sampler you're using. So I'm going to grab the root note from the file name, and I'm going to try to copy and paste it uh, into a root note attribute. So believe it or not, this is actually now a valid decent sampler file. Uh, it won't do what we want it to, but we can load it into our sampler and uh, yeah, see what happens. OK, loaded all the files. So that sounds really cool. Uh, that's not at all what we wanted to have happen, of course. Uh, what's happening is it's actually playing every single sample uh, for every single key. We actually want these to be mapped to pretty narrow ranges. And in fact, there are four round robins, and it's playing them all at the same time. So uh, let's fix those two things. 
So now that we've got all our samples in place, we're going to add two more attributes to each of these sample tags, low note and high note. These are the bottom and top of the range of notes for which each of these samples should be triggered. Right now, uh, I'm going to just copy and paste the root note and uh, we will change the values as we go along. Okay, so let's see what happens if I actually reload this patch in a decent sampler. So as we can see now, it's no longer mapped to this massive range, but in fact, there are tons of gaps which we now need to fill in. This is one of many tasks where having a visual tool would be very handy. And uh, you know, it's not ideal to be doing this kind of thing using a text editor. Um, still, it's pretty quick with a small number of samples like this. Obviously, I could just copy uh, what I have in the contact instrument, but uh, yeah, where's the fun in that? Uh, okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sort all of these by their um, root note. Uh, basically just gonna do a alphabetical sort. And since root note is the first parameter, we got them sorted. Uh, and now I'm basically gonna walk through the entire range and just um, fill in any gaps. This top sample goes from 82 to 82, but there's nothing above 75. So I'm actually gonna make its low note 76. You notice how I don't make it 75 because if I did that, then both of these samples would trigger at the same time. So uh, this one goes from 75 to 75. Well, there's nothing above 72. So we're gonna change this to 73. Basically always making it one more than the next one up. Uh, 72, 71, this one, there's nothing above 68. Okay, this looks pretty good. Uh, since I want this to be at least two octaves, I mean, at least, uh, I'm actually going to uh, stretch this one down to 60, which I believe is middle C. And I'm gonna stretch this one up to 84, which should give us an even two octaves. Now let's reload. Sounds pretty good. Of course, there is still one more thing. You'll remember this sample had round robins and we have yet to address that, which means we're playing all four round robin samples at the same time. It's probably why it sounds so rich. Um, in order to tell the engine about our round robin situation here, uh, we need to include two tags. We need to include something called seek mode, which is the um, round robin mode that we want to use. Uh, and we need to include something called seek position. Uh, so first we'll do seek mode. Uh, and that can be done at the group level or at the groups level. I'm gonna do it all the way up at the top. This is all in the documentation, by the way. There are a bunch of different values for seek mode. There's random, there's round robin. We're gonna use round robin. On its own, this won't do anything because all of these samples will actually get mapped to that first round robin slot. And also our engine doesn't know how many different round robins we have. That's something that it calculates as it parses the file. Um, so we're gonna go here and we're gonna add a new parameter to every single one of these. Sequence position. And we should be able to pull that out of this part of the file name. There we go. Now let's reload. Beautiful. By the way, if we wanted to shuffle this sample into groups uh, and set these uh, positions at the group level, we could do that as well. Uh, let me show you how you do that. Okay, I've now split these into four groups. And since each of these groups has only one sequence position in it, we can actually take that seek position parameter and apply it to the whole group. I mention this only because some people would rather organize their round robins in groups just to keep things logical. And this engine totally supports that way of working. By the way, I'm doing all this stuff by hand just to show you how it works. But if you are actually in the situation that I'm in where you have like an actual contact instrument that you're trying to uh, turn it into a DS preset, and you have the full version of Contact 6, you can actually use creator tools to do basically everything that I've done so far, minus the round robin stuff. Um, yeah, let me show you. Um, so let's open up the Contact version of this. Now I'm gonna open Creator Tools. Now I'm gonna switch over to the Lua script window. And I've got here um, a Lua script called DS Export. I'm gonna drag it here, hit play. And yeah, it outputs basically all of the same information. By the way, if you hold down Command Option C on the Mac, it copies everything that is in the console. And you could just paste it into a file. And uh, yeah, it's a 
usable file. You might have to do some massaging. The only thing that's missing is uh, information about the round robins, which, yeah, you would have to add manually. But if you've done what I was just discussing and have your round robins in groups, the way you have to actually in contact, uh, yeah, it's pretty trivial to add that information in um, at this stage. I'll include a link to the script in the description to this video. Okay, let's add some effects. So there are currently only two effects that can be added to the instruments, uh, low pass filter and reverb. Um, let's add both. So in order to add effects, uh, you add a, I wanna say top level, but it's not really top level. It's sort of like the second level underneath Decent Sampler. Uh, we're gonna add an effects tag. And that's where we define our global effects. I'm gonna go fast through this section because I'm excited to get to the user interface stuff. So um, yeah. Bear in mind, everything that I'm about to say, uh, it's gonna seem all a little bit magical, but it's all in the documentation. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna add is the low pass filter. And we do that by making an effect element with a type of low pass for pole. Um, low pass filters have uh, two possible parameters, frequency and resonance. I'm only interested in the frequency, which is expressed in Hertz. Uh, I'm gonna set it to 22,000, which means the filter will be all the way open. Uh, meaning it's not going to be changing the sound at all. That's all you need to do in order to add an effect to the global effects chain. Uh, now we're going to do the same thing with reverb. And uh, the type is reverb, and the parameters are a little bit different. There are actually four different parameters for reverb. Uh, we're only interested in wet level, which is how much reverb is actually making it into the signal. I'm setting wet level to 0.5, which is 50%, which means um, the reverb will be half as loud as the dry signal. Okay, so that's it for effects. I think we're finally ready to add a UI to this thing. So in order to add a UI to your instrument, all you need to do is define a UI tag. And actually at this level already, this is where you specify the image to use for your skin. Yeah, it's just called background.png. You'll also need to include width and height attributes for your UI. Um, you can use any values, but I strongly recommend using the default values, which are 812 by 375. Uh, I chose those because they seem to work really well on mobile devices. Below the UI tag, there's a tab tag. Right now you can only have one tab, but when I was designing this, I was imagined that someday we might be able to have multiple tabs per instrument. So that's why this is there. It's kind of like a placeholder. Under that is where you define your actual UI elements. Uh, right now there's only one UI element that's possible and that is labeled knob. Um, so yeah, let's add one. X and Y control the position. Label is the actual text that would go in the text label that sits above the knob. Type at this point should always be float. That means that the uh, value that gets generated by this knob is a floating point number. Basically, that's just a number with a decimal point in it. Min value and max value are, of course, the lowest and highest value that this knob can output. And value is the initial value when the instrument first loads up. So now we've added a tone knob. Let's uh, take a look. There it is, it's right there. And it's a little too small and it's a little bit too far over to the right. So I'm gonna futz with the X and Y values until it's in a better position. Okay, uh, that's a pretty good position. Uh, the text though, I need to actually change the color of the text. Eight Fs in a row is uh, white. There's an explanation of um, how these hex codes work. They're a little bit like web hex codes, but uh, they've got an additional uh, alpha parameter at the beginning. Um, yeah, there's a good explanation in the reference guide. Okay, that changed the text color to white, but that text is way too small. Okay, that actually looks pretty reasonable. Uh, I'm gonna add another knob for uh, reverb right next to it. I get a sense that I could play with this forever. Let's, let's just go with it. Okay, so 
we've created two knobs, but they don't actually do anything. Um, in order to have these knobs actually be mapped to parameters of the engine, we need to create something called a binding. A binding basically just tells the engine that when um, some input happens, it needs to actually change something in the engine. Um, input can be either a knob or it can actually be MIDI CC values or velocity uh, values. So let's add a binding for a tone knob. I'm gonna go through each of the parameters as I type them. Needless to say, all this stuff is, of course, in the reference guide as well. Type tells the engine what sort of under the hood setting this knob should affect. In this case, it's an effect. Level tells the engine what level on which to act. Since this is a global effect, the value here is instrument. It's like an instrument wide effect. Position tells the engine which effect we want to manipulate. This is a zero based index, which means that the first effect has an index of zero, the second an index of one, etc. Parameter tells the engine which parameter to manipulate. Uh, there's a list of valid parameters in the documentation. In this case, we want our control to change the frequency of this filter. Okay, now let's do the same thing for reverb. You'll notice it's pretty similar to the first binding, except that the position has been changed to one because this is the second effect. Also, the effect parameter we're changing is different. It's the wet level. Before we reload our instrument, I'm noticing I made a mistake up top. Um, the uh, knob that controls the reverb actually should be from zero to one. And we want our default value to be the same as our effect value down here. Okay, now let's reload our instrument. Okay, let's try them out. Perfect. Let's try the tone knob. Okay, it works. That's pretty much it. Um, there's only one other thing that I should really mention, which is that uh, if you want to redistribute your instrument, um, a great way of doing that is to zip the entire thing, DS presets, sample, the whole directory. What you can do is you can change the extension of your zip file to DS library, uh, and that's actually a format that can be uh, read by any version of Decent Sampler, the iOS version, the Mac version, the Windows version. Uh, so yeah, pretty convenient. Okay, I think that's it. Have fun, uh, can't wait to see what you all create, and um, yeah, see you next time. <laughs>